and welcome to Nerd Talk. I'm Pixie. I'm Sam. And I'm Pyro Sam. And this evening we'll be reviewing Cabin in the Woods. Ooh, spooky. Which... Not so much. Two-thirds of us have seen. Right. Okay. Almost feel like I want to take up the policy of never seeing movies in theaters, because it is very inconvenient. Like, probably I would have seen uh, Cabin in the Woods if I could have just streamed it on the internet for $12, but even for $12 I cannot stream it on the internet, so it's like, oh, well, I guess I'll not go see it, because... Yeah, some movies you can. Yeah, but th by no means the vast majority. They, and it's most of only them after the release. Right. They do a theater release, and then those things might become available later. Really, it no, wouldn't even be Tower so bad. Heist was available before it was released, wasn't it? They did, like, an on-demand preview weekend. And admit it, it was stupid expensive. But, uh, no, they've, they've done that before. The other, it wouldn't be so bad if I could go to the theater and see it at any time, but having to time to a showing to be able to see it, that's like, well, my schedule's kind of tight, so I, I can right. probably find two hours, but I cannot find two hours that are aligned to the two hours the theater wants. Mm -hmm. Also, you want to watch it at 1.5 speed, so it only takes an hour and a half. <laughs> that would also be nice. No, well, that's, that's probably not something I would do to a movie, because that's a fairly carefully crafted experience. I listen to podcasts that way sometimes. And watch TV. <laughs> and watch TV that way. All right, I watched My Little Pony faster than normal. But, you know. <laughs> it gets you through the episodes faster. Let's be honest, My Little Pony is a little slow because it's a kid's show and kids are dumb. <laughs> <laughs> you watch it a little faster. Look, guys, we're giving you better. lots of time to understand this. So... Tell me about Cabin in the Woods. Okay, so Cabin in the Woods is written by Joss Whedon, uh, directed by Drew Goddard. I actually have never heard of Drew Goddard before. Uh, but, as many people know, Joss Whedon, the wonderful, wonderful writer behind Buffy the Vampire Slayer, I see Firefly. nothing. I see nothing about an advanced internet release on the Tower Heist wiki, by the way, so you are wrong. I can look it up later. And, of course, um, the upcoming <sighs> Avengers movie. Yes. Right. So, um, basically, yeah, we're going to spoil the hell out of this thing, so if you haven't gone to see there it There are some spoilers for Cabin in the Woods. Oh no, there are all of the spoilers, and it totally wrecks the experience of seeing this We movie. are going to ruin Cabin in the Woods. Go see it first. Yep, Ooh. so just stop us there, go, go see the movie, and then you can come back and listen and tell us how wrong we are. Seriously, go see it. Because okay. we liked it. Right. Alright, so, um... Yeah, Cabin in the Woods is, like, it's what you get when you mix The Matrix and, like, Scream. Mm. Um, effectively, what you've got here is a group of five twenty-somethings who, following the most basic movie plot ever, pile into an RV and go drive to a Cabin in the Woods. Where, of course, like things the, will try to kill them. It's like on rent from some guy's cousin. Right. Like, it's it's terribly contrived, and you know that right at the start. Yeah, they're like like Scream before it. They are poking fun at the genre the entire movie. They're also kind of giving a big finger to the audience that way. It's like, yep, see here, it's familiar. Is this what you want? <laughs> right. They they even have a couple like red herring plots where they discuss that you know these characters aren't all just stereotypes. Look, the 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 jock guy totally. Like, took these college classes and understands what these books are and was recommending books to, uh, I can't remember, was the other girl was supposed to be his sister? I, I don't think any of them were related. Okay, well. Uh, I'll IMDB this, though. Ended up recommending books to the lead actress, uh, Dana. Like, the, the character who plays the, quote, dumb, sexy blonde in the movie is one far from dumb. Two not a blonde. Two not actually blonde. And she three, does mention that she dyed her hair before the, the start. The dye has actually got like drugs in it or whatever that are reducing her cognitive function. Right. Man, the the organization that set this up did a really bad job. They they couldn't even get a blonde, much less a virgin. 
Nope. Yeah, no, there was they they hang a lampshade on this later with going. We worked with what we had. Yes, so Sigourney <laughs> Weaver has like a sudden uh, guest appearance and is amazing. You apparently didn't have much. Uh, no, she's in the movie for like dedicated to saving the world. Seconds. You can't even find a blonde chick. No less one that hasn't gotten laid. <laughs> so, um. Really, what what starts off as the most uh, contrived horror movie plot ever is, is made out to be just that. And, and they spend most of the movie poking fun at the audience specifically for liking this kind of movie. And it's... it's... It's hinted at very early on that something ain't right or something. Yeah, the here. the very first scene of the movie is these two guys in like a, a corporation's complex talking about what they're going to do. And admit it, you're not going to get it at the time. That that's but, but just then it. like as they leave, there's like you know two guys going with the eagles left the nest or whatever, watching from like nearby rooftops and shit. Right. Like you or should show like a bird flying like nearby where they drive and it's like yeah, yeah the the moment you see the bird hit the invisible wall and incinerate itself <laughs> you figured out what's going on in this movie not an, entirely i wouldn't say that that's you the point where i had guessed it yeah you don't know what exactly the setup is or um how extensive the consequences of the setup are Exactly. Right, and and we'll get to that later. The but... fucking trailer, though, spoils everything. Oh, yeah, the trailer I'm is... I'm glad I didn't see here's, the trailer. Here's the movie. I'm glad I did not see the trailer. Mm-hmm. I, I, I went... I, I, uh... A lot like a the way I saw picture. the original Matrix movie. Someone walked up to me and said, Yeah, you need to go see this movie. And I'm like, I don't know what it's about. Yeah, that's the point. Get in the theater. And it's just like... <laughs> Don't, don't look at anything, just go in completely blind, and I managed to successfully do that. Which is strange, because I'm on the internet all the time, you'd think I'd have gotten spoiled for it. Right. But I didn't. So, um, progressively as the story goes on, we find out that there's this mysterious corporation who is using psychotropic drugs and various other environmental factors to manipulate the characters into meeting these horror uh, genre stereotypes. So, like, the, the jock that you know, was a pretty decent guy before. You know, very nice, very intelligent. Is getting drunk and making an ass of himself. Um, the blonde is just being made ultra horny and stupid. Mm-hmm. Jules is her name. Yeah, the the group pothead. Also, which, Chris Hemsworth is in this, which is like. Yeah, he plays the jock. Which is hilarious because he's also Thor in the Avengers. <laughs> right. As soon as I hear that Chris. Hemsworth is in a movie, the first thing I have to ask is what's his shirtlessness coefficient? Um, two scenes. Not bad. Oh, there oh, are two scenes that. of Chris Hemsworth shirtless in this movie. Um. But he's on a bike in one. Yes, he is on a motorcycle on one of them. I, I absolutely love the pothead in this movie. Uh, uh, Marty. Yep. Could you stop referring to them by their tropes and, like, actually come up with the character names? No, I'm not going to bother, because that's what they are. They are their tropes. There, there's no point to these characters actually having names. Um, anyway, so you were explaining this. Yeah, um, one, the, the Uberbong is possibly my favorite movie prop of all time, and I will, <laughs> I will forever love Joss Whedon if he finds a way to sneak that into the Avengers. If, like, just Agent Coulson walks out holding this little silver coffee cup, I will be the laughing the entire movie. He doesn't even have to telescope it. Just him having the thing will make me giggle. Is that they introduce this character in the best scene possible. Driving in a car with his bong between his legs and the bong telescopes uh, from the bong itself into just a normal silver uh, thermos cup. Which is hilarious. Which he later then wields as a bat. Yep. Becomes a weapon. Goes from bong to coffee cup to weapon. Best movie Everything prop ever? Need. I think so. Shink. I'm sure Joss Whedon has it in his office right now. Uh, you so think it's a working prop? Basic. I wouldn't be surprised. Dude, it's a bong. How difficult is it to make one? You can do it with a cantaloupe and a, uh, and a paper towel roll. You looked at your kitchen to try and think of the word. Yep. <laughs> 
I've been building miniatures for the past two days, so really I would not be surprised if the amount of chemicals I have been using has affected my brain in some way. Maybe you should stop dyeing your hair. Totally. <laughs> dyeing rumors. the stump. There's rumors that's how somebody else we know lost their hair. <laughs> Alright, so continuing. Um, reasons to go see Cabin in the Woods. I guess, yeah, if you, if you watch a lot of horror movies, you already know what to expect from them. And part of the fun of this movie is that they go those routes and then we'll find ways to swing around it. Like, the moment Marty starts to realize that, hey, something's not right here. Why are people whispering to me? Because mm. people are actually whispering to him. Like, you should go for a walk. Or... <laughs> so we should split up. Yeah, like, there, there's, there's this really... Except, instead of in my head, they're just actual people whispering directions to me. Right. There's this really great moment where as soon as shit has gone down and the They're all like, retarded okay, let's lock family down and, uh... stay together, no one leaves, we'll go lock this down one room at a time. And like suddenly the red lights come on and the corporation office is like, no, that can't happen. Make them split up. And so it's like, you should split up. And then like two seconds later, like as soon as he finishes uttering that sentence, he picks his head back up and goes, we should split up. <laughs> And immediately everyone's like, no, bullshit! Um, I, I did love the scene of the the corporate offices where everyone was betting on what monsters would be used to kill these kids. Like, that, that was by far one of my favorite scenes of the movie. Like, why couldn't we make it a merman? And apparently, redneck pain zombies are not the same thing as normal zombies. Not at all. Now, now, it's redneck zombie torture family. Get it right. I have the entire bestiary in front of me. Sweet. We pulled up the bestiary for the movie. We. I. <laughs> Sweet. Thanks to Delexi Art on IMDb. <laughs> you, sir, have a, a fantastic amount of time. Also, they're supposed to be in chronological order from when they appear in the movie. Cool. So yeah, um, eventually the characters manage to escape into the corporate uh, facility beneath the cabin. And upon getting down there, find all of the monsters that potentially could have been killing them. And apparently it's a tradition that in their like office or whatever, the control room, they the different departments... So, like, you've got a whole bunch of different teams who work to make this happen. Electric, maintenance, uh... Biochemical units. Uh, the accountants. Mm -hmm. so. The intern. Oh, Kevin the intern. <laughs> they all bet which one of these monsters is going to be used. And so we've actually got a really cool list. And Because, um, I guess part of it is that they have to choose. Yep. Indirectly, I guess. Well, they there has to be some sort of transgression with a forbidden object, and so there's like a basement with a bunch of these fucking things, and, and it it's could be set any up of them. That these guys are like tempted into going down there, and then in the process of fucking with one of these objects, they summon their what is supposed to be their demise. Yep, and and really, what we're getting into is the idea that um, the the giant monsters that are being placated in the movie. Like, the, this whole process is designed to placate these giant old monsters that... Lovecraftian old gods. Yeah, that keep the world in check. And really, that's supposed to represent the audience in all mm. of this. Because, you know, we're the monsters that get pissed off when the movie doesn't go the way we want it to. Mm -hmm. Or a video game. Or a video game in this case. Thanks, Bioware. So, like, it, in placating these uh, monsters... We have to follow the formula. We have to do as we're told. It has to be one of these monsters that is smiting these kids who have inadvertently uh, done something to piss it off. All the options are there. It's just which one they went for. Um, they, they do say that, yeah, almost everyone needs to die except the potential virgin, who can either die or be severely punished. Yeah, as long as she suffers, basically. Then everybody has to die in a certain order. Yep. And if you screw up the order, the old gods get mad. Yeah, it's one big metaphor for the uh, relationship Which between producers. Which is supposed to explain and... why, why you notice those tropes like, oh, well, so-and-so always dies first. 
Did did we have a black guy? We in this didn't movie? have a black guy, and uh, how did I know you were going to say that? I'm sorry. It's like the oldest horror movie trope in existence. Black guys gotta die first. Actually, no, in the we, Scream franchise, Drew just... Barrymore died first. Yeah. So, um, no, you had the the gosh, what was his name? Holden. Is that a name? It doesn't sound like a name. Yeah, name. that's yeah. that guy's name. So half black guy. He, and he did not die first, he no, died he actually, third. <laughs> yeah, he lived quite a bit. Third for five isn't bad. Actually, technically he would have died fourth, because number three was a fake-out. And then later came back. Still technically a death sequence. So, so if the continuing. organization is making all of these fake horror movies to... Take no, they're real. These monsters are real. Well, these like, aren't like but all of these or anything. The performance horror is fake. movies to placate the yeah. old gods. Yep. I wonder if they're filming them and then just showing them as horror movies, since we're already performing them for the for the elder gods. We may as well just make movies out of them. Yeah, I could see that Japanese one actually happening. Mm. The little girls that destroy the Japanese ghost by singing to it. Well, they didn't destroy it. They turned it into a frog. The happy frog. <laughs> so, <Let us see. laughs> is there any indication of how long this has been going on? Um, a I, long time. Yeah, it's just it's they, not put a number on it. They did say that this was. Uh, this is the evolved version of an ancient ritual that yeah. it used to just be sac uh, like ritualistic sacrifice, and now it takes this form. It was just you know a slab, and you cut some dude's heart out. But <laughs> yep, the elder gods have gotten pickier over the years. Um, isn't that the perfect metaphor? Yep, yeah, I suppose it is. Or right, the audiences get very whiny if you don't meet their exact expectations and, right. and destroy the do world. Mm-hmm. They, they definitely tear down the uh, the crew that made that film's world. Is that somebody's job on the line? Right. Like, how how much does it, uh, must it suck for a director who, you know, put their heart out into making a movie, thought, you know, this isn't the best I could do, but I did, I did what I could. Like... How much does it suck to get bashed just by critics for that? Like, that must feel like, crap, now I'm not going to get another job. I'm done in the one thing that I can do. That's particularly pertinent to Joss Whedon because he is famous for Firefly being cancelled and Dollhouse being cancelled. Well, yeah, he's got such fan appeal... But in marketability, like, traditionally, Josh, Joss Whedon's shows and movies have done terrible. Like, if you're just talking from a financial standpoint, Firefly barely got any viewers when it was on the air. Serenity didn't do all that well when it got to theaters. Oh, it did terribly. On DVD, on DVD it's been fantastic. Uh, but it didn't make any money in theaters. No, of course not. Um... Buffy the Vampire Slayer got, like, pitched around by uh, the Fox Network for the better part of the time it was on the air. It finally landed on FX, which I think is where it finished up. Like, it was not a popular show when it was on. So, Joss Whedon is bitter about fan interaction with creators. Yeah, no doubt. And that, that, that certainly shows through in this screenplay. Right, and this couldn't have been released at a more appropriate time. Thank you, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Mass Effect 3. Um, overall, I'd say the the key scene of this huh. movie that should decide whether I you want to go see I guess there's only the it, one order that the impure dies yeah, first, it, the virgin yeah. last. Yep. Anybody else in the middle can go in whatever order. Yeah, that's pretty standard for horror movies. Um, the one scene that I will say should get anyone excited about seeing this movie, you get to see every horror movie monster just go on a rampage in a room full of uh, SWAT team members. Just each one doing their thing. And everybody else, yeah. Yeah. It is brutal. 
And should I read over the list? Absolutely. Yeah, I guess we can go over the list. Since we're doing a spoiler cast. If we weren't doing a spoiler cast, I'd have been like, go because there's unicorns involved at some point. And that would have been it. <laughs> yeah, you do get to watch a unicorn spear a dude. It, it's pretty awesome. This reminds me Stabbed. of the classic Saturday morning breakfast cereal. There's just a picture of a dude with a giant hole in his head, bleeding out. His brains are oozing out, and it says, As last thoughts go, unicorns are real is not a bad one. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's like watching Rarity go homicidal. So, anyway, Redneck Zombie Torture Family. Yep, those are our main villains. We see him slaughter most of the cast. The evil Japanese ghost thing. Seen attacking Japan, later gets turned into a happy frog. A werewolf. It's a werewolf. <laughs> uh, there's a wraith. So, a ghost, which we do see tear through someone in a hallway. And a fairy. The sugar plum fairy. Yup. Makes a mess. Oh boy, a pixie! <laughs> yup. Fornicus, the lord, lord of bondage, bondage and pain. pain. Oh, Fornicus, you were awesome in this movie. There's, the, 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 he, it's basically the guy from Hellraiser, except instead so of pins, he's mm-hmm. got razor blades in his face. Mm-hmm. Uh, dismemberment goblins. Woo. Yeah, little goblins that just tear through a security guard. Uh, generic zombies. Yep, miscellaneous zombies. A witch. Mm-hmm. Zap someone with a fireball. Angry molesting tree. That's a thing. Grabs a security guard. That's I'm what it does. I'm unsure why, it's, why it can't just be an angry tree. Why is it, it a molesting tree? <laughs> it has a specific thing that it does, and that is it. The end. Giant cobra. Oh, we're not talking like the size of a Labrador. We're talking giant yeah, we're, cobra. we're talking like Resident Evil size cobra. At it's one point, it does joke. bite through the floor. Which doesn't even make any sense. Yup. Horror movie logic. Well, I mean, like, the physics of it doesn't... I'm sorry, in Deep Blue Sea, a shark jumped out of the water, bit Samuel L. Jackson in half, and then crawled back in. Do physics apply in horror movies? I don't think so. Man, now I want to make a horror movie that is just sharks are no longer confined to water, and they can swim through air. And then... <laughs> so that, flying sharks. That's, it, yeah, that's the only premise, is flying, is sharks start <laughs> flying out of the ocean and killing it, people. If logic existed Why do I in feel horror like movies, sci-fi has already done that? It might be. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. There are, all, there there horror are a lot movies. of horror movies based on sharks that are confined to the water. Well, there's that, shark Where the problem is not resolved by just staying out of the water. Yeah, Jaws would have been the shortest movie ever if everyone just went, Huh. Let's close the beach and walk 50 feet that way. All right, we're good. That should be... Yeah, now I want to make a double-length movie that's like four hours long, and the first two hours is just a conventional movie of shark in a lake, and people cannot seem to avoid the lake. And then at about the two-hour mark, people are like, let's avoid the lake. And then, then all of a sudden, the sharks can fly, and they just keep coming. Well, I mean, that's essentially what happened in the piranha movies. I mean, huh, there's evil piranha things in the water. Okay, let's not go near the water. Oh, crap, they found new ways to get us, like, swimming through plumbing and shit. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's like, too oh, it's subtle the and it's too reasonable head. for being completely stupid. Right. I just want the piranhas to just lift vertically, directly out of the lake. <laughs> And then start swimming around in the air. Oh, now they're air piranhas. <laughs> yes. It's great. One of the things I like about this monster list is that this monster list appears in the movie, just written out as a list of monsters. Well, yeah, it's on a whiteboard that they use to take bets. Yeah. You, you see Which these. All of the... Sort of awkward, funny names that the monsters are named. All the funnier. I did it's like. Actually, canon. I did like the, the angry robot. molesting tree is the official name. <laughs> the it's molesting. not just inferred. Why couldn't we have had that there. movie? The Killbot, a golden. I'm reading this description from this user on IMDb's forums. A golden scorpion-like robot with a buzz saw tail. I would see that movie. Oh, here's one for you, Pyro. What? Go ahead. Dragon bat. The dragon bat. This thing gets an odd amount of screen time. A dragon bat seems like it is strictly inferior to a dragon. 
Uh, dragons do not get scarier when you add bats <laughs> to them. Dragons could already do everything bats could do. But it's a dragon bat. <laughs> That's just like a crappy version of a dragon. So or we're maybe talking an improved like, version of a bat. Yeah, <laughs> this is a better it is, bat. It is an improved version of a bat, that's to be sure. <laughs> but it's just a crappy version of a dragon. I think they're referring to the fact that the bat, like, roared and, bre- I believe, breathed fire at one point. I have no idea. That that whole scene was just a clusterfuck of things. It was. It's like everything just explodes out of these elevators at once. It's and then just... there's nothing but blood and messed up interns. There's only the one intern. <laughs> Not after they were done. Kevin Ailey, part three. No, it's it's actually his name is Ronald. I think. Yep, we found out the yeah, intern it's was named the Ronald. Intern. I I misspoke. Tom Link would be so mad at you. Yeah, for some reason he just struck me as a Kevin. <laughs> Kevin is a good intern name. Moving on. See? If I was I mean... naming an intern, I would name my intern Kevin. Interns <laughs> tend to come with names so... reattached. <laughs> no, but they're interns. You can do what you want to them. <laughs> Right. Moving on. Anyway, alien beast. It's an alien and it's a beast. It eats people. Yeah, I guess it kind of looks like a Cloverfield parasite thing. Alright. I don't remember that one very descriptively, but at the time I was more focused on the unicorn that Holy had just shit. killed someone. <laughs> Let's see. Dollface family. Yep. So they're wearing, like... Um, masks that are like dolls' faces with the eyes removed and such. Yep. Um, it's like they're serial killer types. Yeah. They, um, I can't. They tied folks up, covered them in gasoline, and then set them on fire. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember what movie those would have been based off of. I don't care to because I don't uh, watch that much horror. Movie. Christmas, maybe. Or no, Black Christmas? Christmas is the one where the no, serial yeah, killer hides the in the roof. Thing. I know this. I, I've seen this. No, there's some movie where just a screwed up family invades a house and they're all wearing masks. I, I know this and I can't think of it. Why are we bothering to look this up? Because it's bothering me now. Okay, That's moving on. To see this kind Black of. Christmas sounds like a race comedy. No. It, never heard of it's it. It's a remake of a horror movie where, like, a serial killer invades a sorority house on Christmas because they're still there for some odd reason. <laughs> also, I'm a little Is bit interested in this. I don't think you want to see that. No? I, I don't know anything about it other than the premise. It's a Seth MacFarlane movie. We're, nah. we're talking about the, the teddy bear movie. Ah, anyway. What the heck? Um, shoot, I don't know what to look this up by. Why are we looking this up? You don't have to be. I'm doing it. Oh, okay. So, how many of these ritual horror movies were occurring around the globe? Uh, I, I had they were saying that there was one I did in not each know country. There were more than one of these. They said that there was one going on in each country, and that all of the other countries had. I don't failed. think it was each country. <laughs> in each they, country, they showed, that means that's like two hundred and fifty like, okay. rituals. The major <laughs> countries. They showed like Germany, France, England. Japan was going on during the Spain film, but failed. One. There was a Spain. And basically, in each of these places, when the uh, when the movie failed, the place was just torn to shreds by the old god getting loose. And being angry that his movie sucked. Like the set, or the whole country? The country. Oh. Wow. Yeah, they, they showed, like, Germany falling apart. Huh. And that had already happened by the time they were performing the ritual in the U.S.? Yes. The only one that was still going on besides the U.S. one was Japan. All of the other ones Hmm. had a big failed on the screen. That didn't prompt the organization in the U.S. and Japan to be super careful? The Strangers! I knew it started with an S! They they were trying to be really careful. They, like, brought in their best people on it. But even then, screw-ups were still occurring. Man... These people are not very good at this. Oh, not, well, they've not been a doing single it. They've been successful doing it for... horror movie reenactment in the entire world. No, it was they'd been doing it for decades prior. Yeah. And it's they just... all went wrong. We also don't know the frequency the that they night, had yeah. to do this. So yeah, Pixie found the movie she was looking for. It was The Strangers, by the way. Moving on. It came out in 2008. So we've got a group of evil doctors. We've got a, like... 
a, a black haired woman in a white dress called the bride who just slowly walks down the hallway. Uh, some more zombies, the killer clown, because that's an awesome thing. Uh, the unicorn, the scarecrow folk. I don't remember those ones. Oh yeah, those were the ones that got grenaded. Um, a giant spider, because you always need a giant spider. A merman, because it needed to happen. Was there, like, water around? No, it was literally crawling on the floor, and the intention of having the merman in the movie was just to see how freaking lame it would have been if they came up with the merman. It was like, it's, it's the guy's... Well, it's also supposed to be symbolic, I think, of the, like want for the the creative process like he wanted but, something different to yeah, happen this, and then this, he realized I thought that, this was oh, that gonna be cool lame. yep and then it comes back to eat him later but. <laughs> and then you have a giant cthulhu tentacle like, but he was holding the conch and he's like so disappointed and heartbroken about it <laughs> yep the way i imagine that going right is that one of the teens just commits the Hamarsha for the merman to trigger the merman to kill him. And then just like a trap door in the roof opens, and the merman is just dropped on top of him and crushes <laughs> him. And then the merman suffocates because it's in air. Yeah, the merman didn't seem to be doing so well in an open air environment. Um, well, he was eating that one guy. I don't think he needs air. Yep. But, um... Oh, come on. Yeah, the, the scene where you get to see all of them in their respective pens is just awesome. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. They've got all these monsters. And then came the scene where it's like, we're going to unleash all of them at once. Really? Yeah, it was like, I saw the big red button and I was like, oh boy, is it really? <laughs> it's like, balls of the wall, folks. Let's do this. Check off's button. That, that was the moment where Cabin like, in the Woods went from a pretty push good movie to a button. really good movie. Yes, I highly recommend this. I, this is one I will probably be buying on DVD when it comes out. Well, I'm, I'm curious, earlier on, what are the Hamarshas the teens have to commit to earn their deaths? Um, well, the one that summons the redneck pain zombies is specifically the child's diary telling about all the disturbing things that happened. Uh, that gets red, and so it summons the redneck pain zombies. There's a conch shell that, if he had blown in it, it would have summoned the merman. Um, there was a puzzle box, actually a puzzle sphere, that would have summoned Fornicus! <laughs> yep. That but do they actually succeed in committing any of these, other than the first one? They all pick up one of the things. It's but then don't follow through. Yeah, no. The one that actually gets used is, um, the the diary. So yeah, they were all potentially there. The basement of this place was just full of stuff. Each one of them would have summoned a different monster. Full of mistakes to make. Right. Because they have to pick. Yeah, it it was a really cool movie. I enjoyed the hell out of it. And not just for the fact that we got free popcorn based on the theater we went to. Yay for midweek specials. It's not doing too hot for numbers, though. I'm not surprised. It's a Joss Whedon production. Sorry. I love the work he does, but he's not popular. Well, I, I imagine the Avengers will turn that around. We could There's hope no so. There's no way the Avengers won't do 300 million. No, because Joss Whedon's it involved, it's actually just going to do 200,000. Damn it. Apparently there is just a Kevin in the movie. <laughs> Kevin no, is one of the possible role. monsters, though. It's just a Kevin. Listed on the monster board, there is one just called Kevin that you never oh. see. Hell he yeah. He was meant to be a sweet-looking guy who seemed like he might work at Best Buy until he dismembers people. Kevin. Apparently he's in the tie-in book. There's a tie-in book? Yep, there's a book. Okay. Kevin. They added a reaver during the rent. There's a whole bunch of shit in the background that I guess we missed. Yeah. There was like a blob. And... There, there are tons of things added. Just just the fact that they threw a reaver in is kind of cool. Like, hey, we still got one of those guys in makeup? Yeah, I guess. He refuses to take it off. Put him in the movie. Give him some money. <laughs> so, the aftermath of Cabin in the Woods 
Is that just yeah, that the whole Jack world is destroyed and everyone's board. dead? Yeah, the the movie oh, literally ends with the old god's hand slamming up uh, through the main characters and destroying the cabin before it slams down and crushes the camera that the uh, audience is viewing from. It's not very many movies that end in all human life being destroyed. I can get behind this idea. Lol. Apparently there was a Q&A with the director, and the first question asked, after this, like, early preview screening, the first question asked was, will there be a sequel? To which he responded, have you seen the ending to my movie? That's good. We don't need this to be a franchise. Well, I mean, I guess I'm looking at the trivia page on IMDb, and I guess they had originally postponed the release because the studio wanted to convert it to 3D, and then Whedon and Goddard pitched a fit, and then they were like, nope. Good. It, that movie didn't need to be 3D. And also, nothing needs to be 3D in post. Like, yeah, I mean, no. I am a big supporter of inventing new technology, and if 3D worked better, I would be super happy about it, but 3D in post is never, ever good. To date if you the... want something to be displayed 3D, you have to shoot it 3D. Right. Duh. Well, to date, the or only to movie seen. I've seen that... I actually thought, huh, this is better in 3D, was Avatar. That's the, the one and only movie I have ever seen in 3D that I was happy that I saw it that way. I hear a lot of people really liked How to Train Your Dragon in 3D, but I never saw the movie at all, so... It, I liked How to Train Your Dragon a lot, and I did see it in 3D. Yeah. I feel like the effect of the 3D was that my visual acuity was real bad, and I could not make out any of the lines, and it was blurry. Yeah, the, the effect of the 3D and How to Train Your Dragon was, ooh, the roller coaster sequences of riding the dragon are a little more likely to make me nauseous. And I, I don't want to reflexively say no to 3D because there are a lot of people who reflexively say no to a lot of new technologies I'm very excited about, but it needs. I would like it if 3D technology worked better. All right, then. It does not work very well right now. So, that's all we've got for Cabin in the Woods. If you haven't seen it yet, why were you listening to us? I feel like I am not as averse to spoilers as a lot of people are. Like, I feel like... But it there's... ruins the whole point of this movie. Right. Not really, because... This movie specifically. <laughs> This movie specifically is based a lot on subverting expectations, but I feel like I would not be surprised if this was a movie you could see once and then see again and enjoy it the second time. There's a lot of value in the twists, but I feel like I can get that value just by learning the twists secondhand, and then there's also a lot of value in the presentation, and I feel like I can get the value of the twists and the presentation separately. Like, I could get spoiled and then see the movie, and enjoy the twists when I'm spoiled, and the presentation when I'm watching it, and it's all great. Oh, well, I also don't feel like secondhand you're going to get the information in is quite a good way, if that makes sense. Like, how do I want to say this? We are not going to do as good a job describing it to you as you would get seeing it. Yeah, that right. That first scene when the bird smacks into the invisible barrier, there was not a person in that theater that was like, "Whoa, that was amazing." There's quite a bit of humor here too. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Like I, the the scene was more, or the movie was more worth laughing about than than being terrified for. Like, it it was just a good time it was in the theater. Fun. Yeah. It's a lot like seeing Fright Night. You're not terrified, you're enjoying yourself. Uh, uh, I feel like Citizen Kane, in particular, is not ruined by knowing that Rosebud is the sled, and I feel like I can generalize that argument Damn it, to now a lot. I can't see Citizen Kane. <laughs> oh, you didn't know that? You were surprised? No, I'm joking. I've seen, an an I've seen Animaniacs. I've got that. There's that line you were talking about earlier. Spoiler warning for Citizen Kane. I'll have to edit it at the beginning of the show. 
But yeah, the trick is that that is something that you... The movie tells you that there is a mystery at the very beginning of the movie, and it tells you the answer to the mystery at the very end. And so you spend the whole movie in tension, but the twist of, okay, so there's this billionaire who dies and his last words are Rosebud, and Rosebud is the sled that's representative of his lost childhood. I kind of feel like, okay, that's interesting summed up in that one sentence. And then all of the stuff that is deficient in that sentence, that the movie gains by being carefully constructed, is then still present in the movie when I watch the movie. Right. And so I, I still feel the tension of, oh, they're going to reveal it later, and these are the hints, even though I know. And that movie, of course, is one that's often called the best movie ever made, so... It does not necessarily have... It's... Could be argued that that's better at presenting the tension even when you know the answer than other movies. But I, I played Mass Effect 3 without spoilers, and I've seen... I knew spoilers for Amadeus when I watched it. I didn't know spoilers for Glory when I watched it. And I don't... I feel like those experiences are kind of comparable, and... The spoilers or not spoilers didn't make a ton of difference for me. Well, I would still totally watch Cabin in the Woods, and I bet I would still enjoy it. Except you don't like horror movies, and you probably well, that as much. Well, I, I would still but enjoy it as much as I would have ever enjoyed it. Is it basically all of them at once? <laughs> I, I think the way I see it, Cabin in the Woods is a suspense film that pokes fun at the horror genre. Like, be because you know that there's more going on than this is just a horror movie and these people are going to die. There's still some gruesome stuff. Oh, going it's on. gruesome by all means, but, like, so was a uh, law-abiding citizen, and that's not counted as a horror movie. Okay. So, In when... reading Harry Potter book six, and this will be a spoiler, but you probably know it. Um, the book's been out for seven years. You can't knowing spoil that Snape anything. kills Dumbledore actually makes the book more tense than if you didn't know it. Because when it shows up, if you had not been spoiled, it's like, whoa, that came out of left field. Whereas if you've been spoiled, you spend the entire book going, oh god, oh god, what? When is it gonna happen? Oh god. Unless someone spoils it exactly how. Yeah. Like if you still know like the details, then you don't have that. Yeah, I just feel like being super cautious about spoilers is not super rewarding because there's a lot of value to be had in consuming meta media like podcasts that have spoilers in them. Yeah, it, uh, you would en you enjoy it listening to those podcasts and then you still enjoy the movie. It, or it, at it least did I do in my experience. Going a month from buying Mass Effect three and not being able to read fucking anything online. Just knowing that, yeah, there's apparently something up with the ending that's really pissing people off, and I can't read about it because I want to see it. Yeah, avoiding spoilers is very hard. I don't feel like it's rewarding in proportion to how hard it is. I essentially couldn't go to any of my news sites or uh, boards for the month that it took me to finish that game. But we will keep respecting people's spoiler avoidance if they want. You will be warned beforehand in podcasts, yep. at least ours. So, uh, my story, Google Drive. Google, Google Drive. Docs got rebranded as Google Drive, and now it has a Dropbox-like syncing client, wherein you install their software and it makes a folder on your computer, and it automatically downloads everything you have on Google Docs to that folder, and uploads anything you put in that folder to Google Docs. And this is not a new concept, because yes, Dropbox been has been doing, doing it for... for a well, long been doing time. It too, for our show. But uh, Google Drive gives you five gigs out of the gate compared to Dropbox's two. And the thing that I find super interesting about this, well, is kind of something that's not interesting to anybody, but Google Docs used to have insanely cheap storage rates such that there was no way that Google could be performing this storage on their end for these prices. Uh, you could 
before Google Drive was released, get storage in Google Docs and Gmail for like 10 cents per gigabyte per year. Whereas now you can get it at about 10 cents per gigabyte per month. So storage prices for Google Docs have gone up 12 fold since this was released for the reason that people will actually use it now. Because, I mean, realistically, probably nobody was using all that space on Google Docs when you had to manually do uploads in the browser. But whereas you can just put a 10 gigabyte file in your folder, and that'll get synced piecemeal over time now, it's more easy for people to use all that space. And the, the huge price tick up is not as offensive as it sounds because the prices they're advertising at, at now are very close to what Google probably actually has to pay to do this storage. So they're making a profit on it now, although a small one. Uh, I had a old storage plan and I got grandfathered in. So now I have a 20 gigabyte plan that I pay $5 a year for. Whereas if I lost my old plan and had to buy that space new, I'd be paying $30 a year for it. I'd be paying $30 a year for 25 and I'm at 20 now, but it'd be more. And so I find that kind of like super stressful because if, if something ever goes wrong, then I have to, then I lose my plan forever. I almost feel an irrational urge to lose my grandfathered plan and get on a real one just so that I don't have to worry about it. I'm not actually going to do it, but it's like, oh no. Um, this week's anxiety Google. brought to you by the internet. Yes. The thing that could be really cool about Google Drive that it doesn't do is that when your docs are synced to wait, your wait, 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 machine, wait, 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 let me stop you there. Google has a service that doesn't do things that could be done in a better way? You don't say! Well, Sorry. Uh, that's, I feel that's unfair because, I mean... Not everything Google does has been completely perfect, but There's Gmail... always one thing that's like, oh, this is a massive oversight. There's just, there's just okay. one thing in every single thing they do. <laughs> well, now that you phrased it that way, even Gmail has a tiny little tragic flaw. Exactly. That Gmail used to be a basically perfect product, but in the most recent theme change... They made it so that clicking the logo in the upper left does not take you to your inbox anymore. It's like, what are you doing, guys? You had a perfect product, and then you just made it suck in a tiny little way. What's wrong with you? Yeah, exactly. My oh. point My point freaking stands. Okay, go on. <laughs> it perfectly stands. Come on. In Gmail, I just want to click the logo in the upper left to get to the main page. That's the most fundamental UI paradigm in every website. But yeah, the thing that Google Drive does not do is that your actual Google Docs are not stored as editable files on your machine. They're just stored as link files where you double click on them and it opens them in the browser. It would be very nice if you if they were like native files and you could edit them with Word or OpenOffice and then those changes would be reflected in the Google Docs editor. But it's not. Nope. Well, I mean, uh, you, you had all these... Uh... All these complaints. In fact, I remember uh, Google Play really got your blood boiling. Google um, Play did a really annoying thing. Well, does in general a really annoying thing that happened to me the other day. Which is that it was marketed as you buy your songs and you can download them again whenever, forever. And that is technically true. But if you go to the their browser player and you try and download something... From their website, it's like, you only get two downloads from the browser of this song. And so, you can stream it in the browser as much as you want, and they have a proprietary downloader client that you can use to download your entire library, but not specific things. The only way to get a single track out of the downloader is to download all of the music you have on Google Play. If you just want to download a single track... You can you only get two chances to do that. And I cannot conceive of a motivation for this restriction. The only thing it does is make it inconvenient if you move between computers all the time. 
and why are they jackasses? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what it is. And so, if you use their proprietary downloader, you could download your entire library a billion times, as much as you want. It's just, you have to use a lot of bandwidth to get to a particular track. And all of these files are DRM-free anyway, so that if you were a bad person doing bad things, you could use your first browser download to download the track, and then give it to all of your friends. And this restriction does not prevent that in any way. It's just... It does not save them any bandwidth, because their downloader is not peer-to-peer. -peer. So, I mean, I would almost see this as justified if they had like a BitTorrent downloader client where instead of using Google bandwidth that Google has to pay for to download your tracks, it would stream it peer to peer between other people who own that track and are running the downloader. Because that way Google gets the bandwidth for free. But A, that would be illegal because of the way copyright works. That those copies are not authorized. And then... B, it just doesn't work that way. And C, you cannot download individual tracks with their downloader. You have to download everything. And you can't tell it to do one thing before another thing. It's just... It's fine, but it's terrible. Because it's inconvenient for no reason. See, I told you we could go on on this for an hour. Yup. Um, do we have any plans for next week? Seeing the I Avengers. bought Dead Space 1 and 2 for $5 on Steam yesterday. Both well, $10, because for... I bought both of them. Okay, I was going to say, two each. games for $5 would be crazy. What, games uh, that are actually both... survival horror in the survival horror genre? Really? And games that are really $60 retail products that are fairly recent for right. $10 cumulative for two games? That's a well, good Dead, deal. Dead Space 2 was last year and is still one of my favorite games. So, um, hey, you got Steam? There's that. It's a thing. It's a thing. One more thing I wanted to say about uh, syncing software is that Microsoft, like a day before Google Drive came out, released a desktop client for SkyDrive that does the exact same thing. It's, it's a Dropbox alike. And they shrunk their limit from 25 gigabytes to 7, because it used to be only browser-based, and you got 25 gigabytes free, but now that they're making it so that people can actually use it effectively, they made it smaller. But if you have an old account, you have to go click on some stuff to keep your 25 gigabytes. So if you happened to have ever used SkyDrive before, you could go there and click on some things to get some free storage forever. Public service announcement. Nice. So yeah, I think that'll do it for uh, Nerd Talk this evening, unless anyone has anything else. Okay, so Avengers is this weekend? Avengers comes out the 4th, slash 5th. So that's next weekend. Yup. So what are we doing for next week's show? Whatever we find in the meantime. Man, it's finals at school, and it's terrible. Right. It's almost finals. <sighs> um... Telltale released a Walking Dead adventure game, $20 every platform. I am... I was not at all interested in it before I was looking at it just before the show, and I realized it's Telltale, so it's a point-and-click adventure game, and that also means it's $25 and not 60 So I'm like, oh, well, I might want to play that. Yep. So yeah, the Witcher I, 2 has been on PC for 11 months, and it just got an Xbox 360 port last I week. I actually am looking into picking up a copy of Fez, because despite not liking the creator, I am interested in the game, and had been for some time. There's websites on the internet that document how Fez turns people into crazy conspiracy theorists, because apparently there's some puzzle solving in it that you can most effectively do by taking notes while you play. Yes. And so, there's a Tumblr dedicated to people's crazy notes about Fez. All right. And I'm sure it'd be super spoilery if you want to play Fez, because then you would not need to take the notes to solve the puzzles. But it, it is pretty funny how people look like crazy conspiracy theorists when they're taking notes for games. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. So, until next time, this has been Nerd Talk for Wednesday, April 25th. 
I think Sen is hungry. He's trying to end the show real hard. All right. Well, hard ending. I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And I'm Parasim. And you've been listening to Nerd Talk. Catch you next week. <laughs>